I want you to notice something here. Paul decided to sail past Ephesus so that he wouldn't have to spend time in Asia and could get back for this to Jerusalem for the Pentecost celebration. And he goes to Miletus and Paul summons the pastors of the multiple house churches in Ephesus to come to Miletus for a pastor's seminar or conference. He's summoning them to come to a pastor's conference. Paul wanted to pour into them so that he could solidify the plants, these church plants that had been done. Paul wanted to solidify them. So Paul stays in Miletus and sends word to all of these elders of the church, these pastors of the church, these individual house churches to come there to Miletus because Paul wanted to pour into their life. Paul wanted to deal with the leaders to make sure that they were on the proper path and that they were moving with the right attitude. And so one of the first lessons that Paul is emphasizing to them is to serve uh, with a, a strive for a servant's heart which is humility. Paul doesn't want them to get in a position of leadership and get high-minded. Paul said, I want you to be able to strive for a servant's heart, where you realize that whatever it is, you're a servant. The word minister means to serve. A minister is a servant. It's a servant. It's a servant. And it's about humility. Notice verse 18 and 19. And when he had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility. Serving the Lord with all humility. With all humility. With all humility. With many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Now you'll notice that there is absolutely no I in the word humble, but there are three I's in the word humiliation. When folks get humiliated, it's because there's been too much I at work, too much self. And so Paul wanted them to understand that your position of leadership is really as a servant. You're a servant to God's people. You are a servant. Paul regarded himself as a slave serving the Lord. And one of the reasons that he used this kind of terminology is because many of these folks in Ephesus, they either had slaves or they had been slaves. So they understood the term slave really clearly. Paul clearly made it known that he was a slave to Christ. He was Christ's slave. He, he was, it was saying that I've got a servant's heart, a heart of humility. You don't find a proud, arrogant slave. They, you know, they would look down, they wouldn't even look up. And Paul was saying, this thing is not about me, it's about the one that I'm serving. This thing is about Jesus Christ. I am his slave voluntarily. You know, in the Old Testament, a person put their ear to the doorpost and they pierced it through. And they wore a ring in the ear as a sign that they were a slave. But then there's this thing that's called, known as the doulos. It is a love slave. A person who has pierced themselves through and they remain a slave to Jesus Christ voluntarily. See, the, the doulos, the love slave, he, he stayed with his master because he loved him. Even when they could have walked off the plantation, but they chose as an act of their own will to say, I love this person. They've been good to me. They've taken care of me. I love them. And I want you to know I'm not here against my will. I'm letting you know that I'm here volitionally out of my own will. And so Paul talked to them about in, in terms oftentimes of, of being a slave to Christ because this represented a heart of humility. It conveyed great humility and they understood that whole syndrome of the slave culture and, and how they regarded themselves and, and what the disposition was between the slave and the master. And Paul was letting them know that serving the Lord would have its ups and downs. That's when he talked about many tears and trials. I'm glad that he didn't try to sugarcoat it. 
to make people believe that when you get saved that everything is going to blow your direction you know it's going to be hunky dory just wonderful and, and you get saved and you live happily ever after no 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 Paul said no 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 this thing is with many tears and trials tribulation Paul is like I've gone through hell and high water I've been beaten I've been shipwrecked <laughs> you know Paul went through an incredible horrific life of suffering for Jesus but Paul said I count it all joy I count it all joy I count it all joy he really did but humility when you think about humility humility is not thinking less of yourself it's thinking of yourself less it is thinking of yourself less it's saying that I'm here not for me I'm here for Jesus use me Lord if there's something that you can see usable in my life in this situation if I can help somebody as I pass along God just use me this thing is not about thinking less of yourself it's not about low self-esteem it is about simply thinking of yourself less so that you think of the cause of Christ you think about others and the needs that they have and then what God has graced you with to be able to be a blessing to others that's what humility Humility is really about this is about serving ministering a grace that God has placed in your life to others so it takes the emphasis off of what you need and it puts the focus on what you've got that others need and so that we we serve out of a right heart and so Paul is he's, he, he's brought these pastors to Miletus he's having a pastor seminar and he says hey guys listen we're not here to build our own kingdoms this is not about egos and logos he's saying hey guys this is about being a servant we're a servant minister a servant leader who are love slaves to Jesus Christ this thing is not about us it's about him it's about him it's taking the attitude of John the Baptist when he said in st. John chapter 3 and verse 30 uh, where he said I must decrease he must increase he must increase I must decrease that's what it's saying it's saying he must increase I must decrease and so he was talking to them about having a heart of humility a heart of humility so that in ministry if God ever uses you that you don't get full of yourself and start believing your own press you're a human being who's so desperately dependent on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He had to save me just like he saved you. I didn't even get a special, you know, rules for my getting saved. I had to get saved the same way you got saved. I had to believe in my heart. I had to accept Christ in my own life. He's my Savior. He's my Redeemer. He forgave all of my sin. You know, I was on my way to hell too. And so I'm grateful for that. I realize that. And you know, one of the things that really helps me, my heart of gratitude toward what God has done in my own life is the thing that helps to really maintain a posture of humility in my own life personally. I'm forever grateful. I'm forever grateful. I'm forever grateful. God has been wonderful to me. He's been faithful in my life. I'm so blessed and I'm grateful to God. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for his hand of grace on my life. I really am. I'm so thankful. I am so incredibly, desperately thankful to God. Here's another thing that Paul taught the pastors when he brought them in, in this pastor's seminar, not only about humility, but he taught them about counting the cost of discipleship. Counting the cost of discipleship. I want you to notice in, in verse 22 through 24. He said, and see now, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God Paul was saying listen this thing is not all about being in some type of special position and having somebody call you apostle and prophet and prophetess and evangelist and you know and and, and, and uh, the, the reverend the right reverend so and so he, he said uh -uh. no 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 he, he, he said, you're missing listen you, you got to, he said you got to count the cost of this thing count the cost of your discipleship he was letting them know the lesson the same folks that crucified and killed Jesus if they see any semblance of Jesus in your life they're gonna hate you 
And he says, you're going to go through some things. Well, you know, well, you, you're going to be wondering, what have I done? What did I do? It's not what you did. It's what the one who did that you look like, that you resemble, in whose image you were made, that reminds them of the very one who whipped them. It reminds the enemy that he was defeated by this Jesus, and you look just like him. You remind him. And so they hate you because of what Jesus did. And so we have to count the cost of the discipleship that sometimes this thing will cost you everything you've got. It will cost you everything you've got. But let me tell you this, here's the flip side. It'll pay you everything that he's got. It'll cost you everything that you've got, but it'll, it, it has rewards, it has a blessing that is built into it that will incredibly bless your life. Uh, the joy, the joy. Paul did not have regret over the negative stuff being beat and, and uh, left for dead and put in prison and, and wrongfully accused of particular things and all of the things that, that they did to Paul. Paul didn't have a mealy mouth complaining attitude about what all he had done and you know these people have been really mistreating me out here because I was I was preaching a revival and then they came and put me under arrest and they stripped me and they strip searched me and everything I was humiliated I'll never want to go back to jail again <laughs> no, no no Paul Paul wasn't going through all of that Paul said I glory in my tribulation he said, I'll do it again for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ to see some folks saved. He said, I'll become all things to all men that I might by some means save some. Paul said, I'm going to do whatever is necessary. I'm ready. Not only beat me again. He said, you know, goody two shoes. I'm glad I glory in this tribulation. It will cost you your sleep, your rest, your comfort sometime. You got to, I mean, this thing really, it will cost you. If you're going to ever build something that, that's, that's worth anything, it's going to cost you some of your comfort, some of your convenience, some of your, your leisure time. It will cost you. And you got to count the cost of the ministry. You got to count the cost. When you really say, Lord, yes, I'll go where you want me to go and I'll do what you want me to do. When you do that, you are signing a contract with God that gives him but you better read the fine print you better read the fine print because uh, you know you are going to suffer some things you're going to go through some things you're going to have some demonic opposition to happen that's going to be some stuff that you can't even explain that happens in your life you don't even understand Lord now what did I do to deserve this but you get in the kingdom of God and something happens to you you don't even understand God what in the world did I do for what did I do for this? You got to count the cost of this thing. You have to count the cost of the discipleship. And so Paul was letting them know, listen, I'm not exempt. I am not exempt. That was something Paul went through. There was some time these folks that were, that were apostles, some of these folks said, I, they couldn't even come to minister because they were sick. They, they were bearing the burdens of leadership, the, the weight of leadership, and, and it was weighty on them. But if you're going to get something done, somebody's got to bear the responsibility, the cost of getting it done. Whenever you go to a party, somebody has paid the cost for you to come. Somebody has had to clean the place, they've had to rent the place, or they've had to get the music together for the place, the food together for the place, the decorations for the, for the place. Somebody has invested. It costs somebody something. There is no free Lot, somebody pays for the food. Somebody has to pay the caterer. Somebody has to pay. There is no free lunch. You got to count the cost of this thing. Count the cost. Not only in money, but in time, in energy, in effort, in sleeplessness. You're going to have to count the cost. Count the cost of being falsely accused. People will assign false motives to what you're doing. Oh, look at them. They think they're trying to do everything. They're trying to, they're trying to be seen. You'd be surprised, but you have to count the cost of discipleship, count the cost. And so Paul knew that his troubles had not ended. Uh, he knew that many more troubles awaited him in Jerusalem. And then Paul was like, I'm not even going to Ephesus so I can hurry up and get to Jerusalem, even though he knew that trouble awaited him. This man was running toward trouble. Boy, if I know that there's trouble awaiting me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang out in a place, you know, to, you know, I'm going to almost be late getting there. I'm like, oh, Lord, my bad, Lord, I missed it. <laughs> 
But Paul, Paul skipped some places. He skipped going to Ephesus so he wouldn't be late getting to Jerusalem, even knowing that in Jerusalem there waited tribulation for him. Paul, Paul was in a, in a hurry to get into the will of God. So the safest place you can be is in the will of God. It is in the will of God. If you're persecuted, if you have to go through this, that or the other, sickness or whatever it is that you're dealing with, whatever it is, in the will of God is the safest place that you could ever be. The safest place that you could ever be. And so Paul just shared his experience so that other folks in ministry, he's, he's doing a minister's conference here. And so he shares his own experience so that other folks in ministry would count the cost whenever they accepted an assignment to Christian leadership. Here's the next thing that Paul taught. He taught them to guard against counterfeits. Guard against counterfeits. Now I want you to notice something very, very carefully here. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flocks. Now listen, this, is, this message is not talk, talking to general members. He's talking to pastors in a pastor's conference here. He's saying, pastors, take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves and then to the flock. And I know a lot of people who are in ministry that always want to take heed to the flock. And they take little heed to themselves. Second Timothy 2.15 says, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It says study to show yourself approved. It didn't say study to preach. It didn't say study to teach. You ought to study to preach. You ought to study to teach. But he says that's not the real purpose of it. The purpose of it is for you to study it so that it becomes a reality in your own life so you can be it to the flock. And so he says take heed to yourself. Let the word speak to you first. Let it minister to you first. Let it talk to you first. Let it cut you first. Let it correct you first. Take heed to yourself and then to the flock. In that order. He's teaching them apostolic order. Take heed to yourself and then to the flock. Then to the flock. Then to the flock. Listen, I don't read my Bible to find a, a text to be able to preach. I read to find meat for my soul. I got to eat. I'm not going to be a cook in the kitchen emaciating. I'm sorry. I'm gonna be, if I am cooking, I'm going to be tasting everything. I'm going to have to go and do some Pilates and some, you know, some of everything else because I'm, I, I'm tasting so much. While I'm eating, I'm like, oh, Lord, that's good. I, I'm not going to just be preparing stuff, and I'm not going to be a first partaker of this stuff. I mean, I, I had a lady one time to fix me some, some stuff. I hope she's not here watching by television. <laughs> but I'm like, she could have kept this because she obviously didn't taste it. <laughs> if she did, you know, I just can't believe that she had tasted that. Before, because had she tasted it, she never would have released it to go out <laughs> to anybody that she cared about or respected or loved. And I said to myself, with, with friends like this, who needs enemies? <laughs> so you ought to taste your stuff. You ought to be the first partaker of it. So Paul, in the pastor's meeting here, is saying, listen, take heed to yourselves. Take he He's trying to solidify the church the, that he has planted. He says, take heed to yourself and then to the flock. Take heed to yourself and then to the flock. Now this will work for your family. He's saying, mom and daddy, take heed to yourself and then to your children. Don't try to teach your children to do stuff that you're not demonstrating in front of them. Shame on pastors who would encourage people to tithe and the pastor won't tithe. Oh God. You know, you, you will be surprised. You, that's all that I'm going to say is that you will be surprised. You will be surprised. You will be surprised. You will be surprised. Will be surprised. That's all I'm going to say. But he's warning them to guard against counterfeits. Counterfeits. P. 
people who want to feed the flock with stuff that they refuse to eat. And so, one quality of maturity is discernment. Discernment. It is really the mark of maturity. Discernment. He's saying that Christian leaders should be able to discern truth from falsehood. You've got to have mature folks so that the folks are not wrapped up in idolatry, in idols, in fables, in myths. They have to operate in truth so that when some new stuff comes up, you need somebody who's mature to say, listen, is this legitimately from the Lord? Or is this a tactic of deception of something that sounds good but has got cyanide in it? And it's going to cause the spirituality of the people of God to decrease. This is getting the people excited. They're getting all excited about this. But you need some elders who will sit on the walls and be discerning and said, you know what? I'm holding this thing up to the standard of the word of God. And, and I know that this person is saying it real smooth and it sounds real sweet. And people were standing up and waving their hands at it. But is this thing really in line with biblical truth here? Is this thing biblically sound? Is this, is this in line with the character and the nature of the almighty God and the nature of Jesus Christ? Is it in conflict with some biblical principle? You need mature folks that can discern uh, the true from the false. And then notice in verse uh, 29 and, and, and 30 here as he said, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And then he says here, also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Now he's warning them against all of this counterfeit stuff here. Now Paul warns them that the devil is going to attempt to introduce deception both from outside the church and from within the church. I want you to notice that. Look at verse 29 again. He says, savage wolves are going to come in among you. They're going to come in from the outside among you, not sparing the flock. They're coming in to fleece the sheep. Paul's, Paul is warning them. He, he said, they're going to come in from the outside. They're coming in. And then notice he said in verse 30, and from among yourselves. He says, not only will they come in from the outside, some of them on, who are already on the inside are going to rise up. Speaking perverse things, losing their mind. Touch a neighbor, say, I know that person. <laughs> and notice the purpose, to draw away the disciples after themselves. To draw away the disciples, the students, the learners after themselves. We're not, we don't have any business drawing anybody after ourselves. We ought to draw them after Christ. While men slept, an enemy has come in and sown tares among them. See, sometimes it happens from the outside, sometimes it happens from the inside. But the key is, is that you've got to have somebody who is a watchman for the house, who are discerning from both inside and outside to care for those who are under your covering. And so obviously, Paul laid a solid foundation in the hearts of those Ephesian pastors to discern evil. How do I know that? because of the message that Jesus gives to the Ephesians many years later as recorded by John in Revelation. It confirmed this in Revelations chapter 2 and verse 2. Notice this, Jesus says this in Revelations 2, 2. I know your works. He's talking to the folks at, in Ephesus. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear with those who are evil. And you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. This is Jesus talking to the church at Ephesus. He says, I know, I know that you, he said, I know your works, I know your labor, your patience. He said, you, you, can't, you can't stand uh, deceptive folks. You can't stand evil folks. He says, you've tested them, the folks that said that they were apostles, and they are not, and then you found them liars. You know why? Because Paul labored with them. Remember in the previous chapter, he, is, he taught for years in the, the Tyrena school in Ephesus. He solidified the church in Ephesus and taught them incredible discernment so that they were not easily drawn away and enticed 
because they had been matured. Once you know the truth, folks can't pull the wool over your eyes. When you've been exposed to the genuine, you'll recognize a counterfeit. And, and, and the real discerning folks understand that you don't recognize a counterfeit uh, just by looking at it casually. You got to examine the details. The details are the thing that always give you away. It's always the details that'll give the counterfeit away. But you will see the counterfeit in the detail. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Join us again next time for Power for Living, where revelation is power, power for living.